is town hall happening and then we have another one coming in a couple weeks so um keep a, a lookout for that um and um i i'll will come back to me during the introductions um i'll let uh angie um take it away from here thanks angie thanks anthony um hello everybody i'm going to give you kind of an overview of how this is going to go um, first, we are at capacity at 100, but I did want to let you all know that, that we are recording this and we will post this after the fact for anyone who couldn't join or for you to take a look back at. Um, today we are going to do a quick intro with the folks we have here and then we will go into directly into audience uh, Q&A. Uh, the majority of you should see a, or all of you, should see a uh, chat, uh, or I'm sorry, should see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And that's where you can go ahead and post your questions. And I will present them to the appropriate panelists for this time. Um, and I recognize that there are a lot of questions and we may not get to all of them, but we will certainly do our best. And like Anthony mentioned, we will have another town hall with a different cluster of organizations in two weeks. And if it goes well, hopefully this is something we can keep up uh, on a regular basis. So with that being said, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, for you guys, if you could briefly state your name, your organization, uh, a general about and what your organization mm -hmm. does, and then uh, kind of what you're doing and where you're heading in this uh, during in this time of the pandemic. Um, Peter, I'll throw it to you first. Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Peter Hall. I am the director of the Illinois Film Office, and I've been on the job for just over a year. And the first 10 and a half months of the job was great. Uh, we had a record-breaking year of film production in 2019. <laughs> and uh, then zero film production since March 16th. Um, but what I'm doing in the interim is um, answering a lot of questions, uh, sometimes without an answer. Uh, the questions these days are less when we go back to work, but how we go back to work. And uh, you know, we're still processing tax credits. That's really what the film office does. We process the film production tax credit. We help filmmakers with locations, and there's a big backlog of tax credits. So we've been pretty busy. And then the final thing I've been doing is um, I've been part of the governor's uh, All in Illinois campaign and the First Lady's uh, Arts in Illinois campaign. So I've wrangled a bunch of um, celebrity videos uh, for both of those campaigns. Um, and it's, you know, we've been plenty busy, but we would rather be busy in the ways we typically are. Thanks, Pierre. Brenda, you want to take Hi. it? Yeah, so I'm Brenda Webb. I'm the executive director of Chicago Filmmakers, a not-for-profit media arts center. We have classes and screenings and filmmaker services. We produce a couple of film festivals. And like everybody else, we're trying to figure out how to pivot our programs to online. We've uh, started our uh, classes online, um, actually back in March, mid-March. Um, some classes are harder to pivot than others. Obviously our production classes, so we're reworking those. Um, with teacher demos of equipment and kind of doing at least a version that we can offer to the public of production classes. Um, had to cancel our summer classes, but our summer camps, but now are trying to figure out how to offer those virtually and how much time we can expect kids to sit in front of Zoom and not go crazy. So um, our film screenings, we're about to launch a couple of programs. Um, one of them is to um, screen films on distribution platforms, which a lot of the other organizations are doing. Um, it's kind of the easiest way to kind of present films is to kind of go through existing distribution um, channels. We're also launching a local showcase, a Chicago showcase. So we'll be sub um, sending out a call for entry so that we can uh, exhibit local work. Um, our Onion City Film Festival, which was set to open March 12th, which we had to cancel literally the day that it was to open, is going to be launched virtually in June. Um, you know, our Reeling Film Festival in the fall, we're still trying to figure out uh, how, how to do that virtually and looking at different models for that. Um, our production fund, um, which awards grants each year, is on hiatus until we kind of figure out how to re-strategize that. Um, and we do have a new program called Community Conversations. Um, so these have been 
happening almost weekly where we're having these kinds of chats, uh, just kind of getting people together to kind of talk about what's going on and focus with a guest speaker. In fact, Angie is our guest uh, moderator tonight, so she'll be online with us tonight at 530. That's it. Thanks, Brenda. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, Colette. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Colette Gunim, and I am the co-founder and executive director of Mezcla Media Collective, which is an organization specifically meant to lift up over 500 women of color filmmakers in Chicago. So usually our programming is definitely more in person. and We've also had to make the same pivot around doing it all virtually now. So we have monthly meetups. We have technical workshops as well around like editing and a silver lining for us has been able to like actually connect with industry leaders that are outside of Chicago. So having different webinars with um, like Kickstarter and we're planning to have one with different Sundance programmers. So being able to bring industry to Chicago, women in film, women of color in film. And the other big pivot that we had to make was really understanding what the priorities are for our community. And even though programming is important, we definitely understood that the biggest setback has been financially and really figuring out how we could use our collective power to bring financial resources to our community. So we started a COVID relief campaign that I could talk more about as the conversation continues. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Colette. Christine. Hi, uh, nice to see everybody or on the screen and nice to know that everybody's out there in cyberspace. Um, I'm Christine Dudley. I am the senior advisor to the Illinois Production Alliance. And uh, as a matter of background, I was uh, the, had Peter's chair for four years. And my background is in public affairs, public policy, and politics. And ironically or uh, not, um, when crisis, politics is all about crisis and management, crisis management. Uh, every campaign is a crisis from moment to moment, not of this severity. So one of the role, the role of the IPA is really to serve as the association of record for the production. Production being not the creative side as Angie and Anthony and many of you are, um, and Brenda are involved in, but uh, the nuts and bolts of both the, um, the physical structure, the vendors, uh, the unions and guilds, um, labor management, if you will, on, uh, on the goals and objectives that they have. Think about uh, many people, um, the Restaurant Association, we're hearing a lot about them uh, because of what's going on with the pandemic. The IPA um, serves that role in terms of production community um, and both from an advisory role for public policy and also legislation. Our role is also to very much support the film offices. Uh, Peter and Kwame at the Chicago Film Office, we've been in uh, very close communication um, as it relates to this. And going back to my crisis management, um, the IPA was in the midst of some revitalization when the pandemic hit. Uh, we had some big plans, as everybody does, um, but uh, we had to pivot and uh, broke it down into three categories. Relief, readiness for reentry, and recovery. Relief, just so we could be part of the communication to our community on what relief efforts are taking place, both at the government and the philanthropic, philanthropy. Um, so digesting some of the, the rules um, of unemployment insurance. I, we've all learned the new acronyms, PUA, and how that was gonna interact from the federal government to the state government, kind of dissecting that and just communicating and holding some hands and trying to move people through the process so they had that relief. And also being aware of all of the uh, philanthropic efforts, as Peter mentioned, he's been very um, participatory with the, with the First Lady's efforts on the Arts Alliance side. Readiness for recovery, as Peter mentioned, uh, we are all collaboratively, we've all read over a hundred different protocols that have um, been socialized around to what it will look like to be safe. We've been in communication both with labor and management, both here and nationally, to understand a little bit better what that will look like and uh, coordinate with the gov government side and providing some guidance. Um, 
and then recovery. What does that look like? And what about, what is our industry going to look like? And I have a lot of opinions on that. Um, and Peter and I actually had a call this morning where we went over quite a few, shared some of those thoughts, but um, at the end of the day, one would be positioned and ready on that runway for when the gate, when the green light goes off and how can we even make our industry stronger and better here in Illinois through some legislative efforts um, and some policy development that will um, provide us a better marketing opportunity. Thank you, Christine. Anthony, you wanna yep. take it from Chicago International Industry yep. Days? Yep, so uh, Industry Days, if, uh, if you guys don't know, is the um, kind of filmmaker development uh, workshop uh, event that we have every year that happens at the film festival in October. Um, this is this will be the sixth year and the festival and industry days is moving forward um, despite the pandemic. Um, we are um, planning uh, for the fall and actually um, planning for events like this and other uh, events like master classes virtual in the summer. Um, and we, um, we actually have filmmaker Q and A's tonight. We have a Q and A that I'm moderating with the director of Spaceship Earth, a documentary that Neon's releasing at seven, uh, if you wanna join in. Um, so we're moving forward with industry days. Um, uh, my hope is that in the next few months, conversations like this will help me uh, articulate and implement what this year's industry days will, will uh, um, will be, um, you know, what kind of panels, what kind of discussions, um, if we have to pivot to online in the fall um, for industry days, I feel like that we can do that, like this event, we can do the pitch uh, virtually, we can do um, meetings online with decision makers on the coasts virtually if we need to. So um, I, th I think industry days um, can remain a strong program for the festival, even if we have to go online. So. Uh, I'm pushing forward. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Um, and then I'll share a little bit about uh, IFA Chicago. I know there's IPA, there's there's a lot of different Illinois and I acronyms going on. So I hope that this serves to help keep them separate. Um, Independent Film Alliance Chicago uh, launched uh, as the result of a merger between IFP Chicago and Stage 18 Chicago in February of this year, uh, naturally right before the pandemic hit. Um, and we have uh, been focusing on, as Colette and Chris and most of and Brenda had mentioned, uh, a virtual pivot for our programming and the services we're providing for our community. We, in addition to coordinating events like this, I would say the silver lining to Colette's point has been the ability for us to bring in higher tier professionals and higher caliber individuals virtually to connect directly with our members, which is really exciting. We, uh, we had Alexander Payne join us last month and uh, next Thursday evening, we have Peter Seraph who's an Oscar nominated producer. He did Little Miss Sunshine and The Farewell and things like that. So we are still working to provide uh, virtual programming, both in the forms of that series, with, which is called Executive Talks and in our movie club series, which is like a book club, but for movies, pretty basic, but it's fun. And, uh, you know, uh, my, my intention and my hope is that through these conversations, uh, with all of us, we can better understand and hear what the community needs during this time and how we can adapt our organization to better serve, whether that's programmatically, financially, uh, communication of information, whatever it may be. So that's IFA. Um, I would love to get to some questions now, but before I do, I kind of want to throw it to you, Peter, and um, potentially, Chris, if you want to hop in to to just if you could give us kind of a a, a general state of the union, <laughs> in in so many words, <laughs> of, sure. um, of what's happening in, here in Illinois during yeah. this time, that would be great. Well, it, it's really changed over the last two months. The the first couple of uh, weeks, it was a lot of questions of uh, 
how can I help like an organization help uh, f famously uh, all the Chicago shows donated uh, tons of PPE to the cause. Uh, uh, IATSE uh, had a vendor that uh, flipped and started making masks. So it was a lot of questions of how can we help and then other questions of how can you, me, Peter, and the government help? Uh, a lot of that was sort of directing people through the whole, um, you know, uh, process of unemployment and of so many contractors and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's been very, very difficult. Then we sort of transitioned out of that to sort of a middle time where organization, Hollywood was calling us saying, uh, we've got projects we want to bring to Illinois. Uh, what's it look like there? And uh, we really predict that it's going to be boom time uh, here uh, once we get the green light to go back to work. And then that brings us to the third thing. And this is what Christine and I were on a call partly on earlier. And there's going to be a uh, large meeting of industry folks a week from today about it, uh, uh, talking not so much when we go back to work, but how we go back to work. And as Christine said, you know, we're reading, you know, getting guidance from all over the world. Um, and sorting through it, and there's no one answer. Uh, and then ultimately, I think jurisdictions are going to, you know, have a say. I mean, the state and certainly the city are going to say what we can and cannot do. So that's sort of where we are and, and what we're doing. We don't we don't have an answer. We're we're not circling, uh, you know, July 5th on the calendar and saying we're all going to go back to work. Uh, we're trying to be. Our our message has been uh, no speculation just trying to deal with facts and science and all that sort of stuff and, and best practices. So therefore we talk to a lot of people. And just queuing off of what Peter said, um, one of the things that we're anticipating and many of you listening probably have read about in the trades and have been following it. Um, it's anticipated this week that the, um, the labor management safety committee, which has been, was established in the mid eighties, uh, which brings together the uh, the studio producers and all of the various um, uh, bargaining units that are a part of that, which are any from SAG to the musicians to IATSE. Um, they have collaboratively pulled together, and to Peter's point, um, you know, with scientists and um, safety experts uh, to determine a baseline on what um, will be um, the industry and management believe are the best practices at this juncture um, for um, production. So that greatly anticipated document that I think we will be working off of and queuing off of, obviously the interconnectivity with government, as um, we all know, they will have to sign off on it, but it gives us a broader uh, sense. We are a client community for the most part, um, in terms of the bigger productions. So uh, LA and the labor management uh, team really does got, their, their standard will be that baseline because when we're, Chicago Fire is going to follow those guidelines co in coordination with the local, state and local governments. So mm -hmm. we're anticipating that. So that's the state of the state as it relates to uh, the broader picture. And then of course, um, everything that's happening on our day-to-day -day lives um, in terms of what does region one mean and two mean and all of that. So we watch the governor every day, Peter. <laughs> about, the, um, about shooting safety guidelines, um, I did want to point out that uh, the Sundance Institute has already published a working document. We've seen uh, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's spe it's specific to documentaries, but if anyone wants to see what kind of these initial uh, frameworks are going to look like for going back to shooting. I, I think it, it's 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 useful to to uh, to look at it and look at the guidelines that they're setting out for docs, which I think is probably going to be similar to fiction. You just Google safety guidelines, Sundance Institute, um, and there's a like a collab uh, document that you can take a look at. And on the same lines, um, the Association of Commercial Producers put out their guidelines last week available uh, for them. Again, Google safety guidelines for film um, if you're interested. And we are keeping an inventory, a library, if you will. So if anybody has a particular country in mind, we might be able to access it for you. New Zealand seems to be the hot topic right now. Thanks guys. Um, on that note, and I know it looks like David asked this question as well. I was wondering, 
Peter, if you could speak to the status of the Illinois tax credit and maybe more in general, how this does or does not affect tax credits here in Illinois. Well, we have been uh, processing tax credits for all the, all the pro productions that have uh, already filed their claims. And I've been mailing out transfers and all that sort of stuff. So the system is working. I did get a call 10 days ago or so from HBO uh, asking me this question, and I was thrilled to give this answer. I said, um, uh, Jay Rowey, the head of production for HBO, said, um, is there any going to be any retraction in their credit? Like uh, New York State went from 30 to 25 percent. But that uh, was pre-pandemic, Peter. Right, right. But, but still, they were, you know, what's going to happen to us? It was actually, I think, officially in April, I think, for, for New York. I think. Yeah, he signed, he signed out on April 2nd. But the, um, and I was able to say to Jay, no, uh, right now there's not going to be any change in the tax credit. And in fact, uh, we would like to, and I don't, I don't know what the, uh, what the government is going to do on this, but it would, you know, we've had discussions about expanding the tax credit. Um, again, that all depends on the government and General Assembly, and they're going to go back to uh, work in a week. And it's going to be a very specific, targeted uh, General Assembly session. So I don't think that's going to come up then. But right now, no changes, uh, and we're moving forward as as usual. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start answering some of the questions in the Q and A. So if you guys have any more, please feel free to put them in there, and I will do my best to get to as many as possible. Um, uh, Chaka, I will come back to your question. I did want to throw this one to from Grace to you, Chris. Mm -hmm. The question is, is IPA working with Arts Alliance Illinois to bring updates and to advocate for industry workers for relief? Um, not specifically with Arts Alliance, although I, um, we are um, part of their, their Thursday conversations. They have a Thursday conversation that's open to the public that you can sign up for. Um, they've been, they're a much more robust association in terms of six individuals on their staff. So they've been a very good guidepost. We did, um, the national unions put together a letter to the respective production center governors um, at the beginning, about in the middle of this conversation, uh, identifying some of the U of I issues that are specific to the gig workers, the 1099 um, and uh, as we uh, crafted that with our local unions um, to be a part of the conversation and sent that uh, to the governor's office to, I know there are still some glitches and um, I think the Arts Alliance has done an amazing job of being at the forefront of a lot of that uh, information and we're digesting it as well and sending it out um, to our weekly um, now has become a weekly newsletter. Uh, anybody who would like to get the newsletter who isn't, uh, just shoot us an email at illinoisproduction at gmail.com. And uh, we, we welcome all suggestions and, and uh, ideas. And uh, so give us a, drop us a line. Cool, thank you. Um, on the note of the tax, while we're still on the tax incentive and credit, uh, Peter, question from Ted is outside of New York, have you heard of any other states incentives that are negatively impacted? I, I have heard Georgia is going through some issues. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they've changed the tax credit. Christine, you may know that. No, I, know I think that, they were in negotiations yeah. pre-pandemic, as yeah. you know, Peter, and they yeah. were, there was a lot of conversation yeah. about uh, they'd had um, actually some malfeasance that yeah. had been revealed by a, a better government association. Yeah, so they that's, were, yeah that, that's, that's the other state that I, I'm aware of, but uh, I don't think, uh, I don't know of any other changes. But again, my ear has not been to the ground on that. I'm worried about Illinois. Yeah, I, Ted, to your question, I've been kind of culling all of those places and looking, and quite frankly, legislatures haven't been meeting. So um, that also, uh, would be an indicator. Um, the, m many of the legislatures have not, and when they are meeting, as Peter pointed out, as we'll do here, they're just meeting in crisis mode uh, to take care of the immediate things that are necessary. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so to broaden out the conversation a little bit, um, Chaka has asked, 
She says, hello, I advise cinema and television students at Columbia College Chicago. Uh, what advice do you have for graduates who are entering the job market and are having a hard time finding opportunities? Hang in there. <laughs> Hang in there. Uh, you know, it's, it, it'll get better. I mean, I hate to say it. I wish you could say, oh, jobs are coming, but they will when they, when, you know, we get back to whatever normal is going to be. I mean, I think you've got to hang in there. You know, it's going to, I firmly believe, and I think others on this panel will think the same thing, that it's going to be boom times here. That, I that say when, sign up for Brenda Webb's programs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, you know, the, the program, and I'm defer to Brenda. I mean, talk a little bit about that. I mean, the experiences that people can get at the filmmakers. And by the way, congratulations on your grant from, uh, from the Academy. Oh, thank uh, you. Uh, that was really wonderful news and to the um, also to Chicago International Film Festival. Congratulations on the grant that you received. But Brenda, I would say that you would probably be able to give some good guidance and also invite people to sharpen their skill set. Right. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's, it's sort of really, I mean, I think we're all just kind of trying to figure it out right now. Um, we, um, by the way, that Academy Foundation grant was uh, originally intended to be a free workshop for LGBTQ youth um, to um, train them to be part of the workforce of Chicago's booming industry. Um, uh, that, that can't happen exactly as, as intended. And so the Academy Foundation, like so many uh, foundations and the philanthropic community has been really amazing. Uh, they, I, I, you know, they've, they've basically allowed organizations to decide how to spend that money. And so, um, so it's given everybody a lot of freedom to kind of sort of get through this period of time without worrying about, uh, you know, being able to exist at all. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, so that's been that's been really great. Although we really want to get back to our programs and spend our money on our programs. Similarly, with our grants program, you know, we've been awarding a hundred thousand dollars each year for local productions, and uh, we were in the middle of a strategic planning process, uh, which was supposed to be a three-year plan and turned into a Q2, three, Q4, 2020 plan. Um, so you know, we want to try to get get that back up and we're on hiatus with that right now but we're really hoping to start awarding grants again when we can take applications from filmmakers who really can project when they can shoot and, and what their schedules are so meanwhile um you know with our uh like i said before we've pivoted some of our classes online um the production ones being the most challenging but similarly to uh, what colette said is that we're also reaching out to some former chicago people who've um, become very established in LA and other places to invite them to teach master classes. So we're going to be launching that. And so in, in a way, you know, the sort of making lemonade out of lemons is that, um, you know, there are going to be new opportunities that we're all going to be offering uh, uh, people because um, we do have this, we don't have these geographic limits anymore uh, that we've always, you know, had to contend with. And we found with our classes, even though we haven't gotten enrollment back up to where it was, um, we're also finding people signing up for classes from out, out of state, Washington, and I think there was somebody from Oregon or, or whatever. So um, we don't really have the marketing budget to kind of reach that sort of scope, that national scope of, uh, of, of people, but we did issue a national press release. So we are starting to see people signing up for our classes from out of state, which is kind of exciting. Um, I mean, we all just really want to get back to normal, but I think, I think these changes will be permanent. I mean, I think we, you know, now that we've kind of opened uh, this can of worm about virtual uh, classes, which we had actually been resisting for a long time. We've been, you know, people have been asking us why we're not teaching classes uh, for a long time and we really didn't want to. We really wanted to stick with that kind of sense of being a part of a community. But now that we have started offering classes, I think that'll be a permanent part of what we, what we offer, uh, not supplanting the in-person experience, which we really hope to get back to, but will be an additional um, opportunity and benefit. So. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, I think we're all kind of trying to figure it out as we go along, but there are some opportunities along the way too. I would, oh, uh, I would also add two things that I think are beneficial strategies. One is definitely leaning in, in, especially since a lot of them are students, leaning into what skills they already have that are possible to do online and remotely. So personally, we've received a lot of 
job postings around graphic design and assistant editors. And if you have those skills and are interested in pursuing them, I would definitely say to try to work on that since money is needed. It might not be your favorite thing to do is like making graphic posters, but <laughs> if it is, then this is your perfect time to do that. And then the second thing is really using this time to have informational interviews with companies and people that you want to be connected to because now that everyone's at home, you can have access to these people that you wouldn't normally have access to. So maybe in the Columbia College, maybe there's some sort of alumni portal that you can reach out to um, either potential people that you're interested in having jobs like them or companies that you'd want to hire you and not necessarily putting yourself like, oh, I want this job, but just saying what kind of skills are you looking for for those jobs? So um, using, those, using that time for that as well. And I was gonna say, it's not exactly jobs, but for film students and for filmmakers who um, already have projects, um, you know, despite the fact that film festivals are migrating online, uh, I think that there is a, still an appetite, probably even particularly for short films in these online film festivals around the country and around the world. Um, you know, I think features, um, it may be, it's slightly trickier um, because of people being more concerned about um, exclusivity and, you know, selling streaming rights and stuff. But for shorts, uh, everyone, everyone is, I think, more open to screening shorts online. So I think filmmakers shouldn't be afraid to reach out to festivals um, and, you know, say, are you, you know, are you moving forward and are you still uh, programming and, you know, and and then uh, look into submitting the, their your short films to festivals around the world. The other thing, of course, is it's a great time for writing and development. And uh, you know that's that's an area where I think filmmakers sometimes rush. Um, so again, it's not it's not paid work, but you know take the time now to 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 focus on the writing and development. Definitely. I mean, one of the things that's going on in LA is if you read the trades every morning, the the writers' rooms are buzzing and the development deals are being made. So, um, you know, there's a lot of time to think about that. And there, you know, there's going to be, as Peter put forth, you know, boom time, but use that for your own creative experience. Um, sign up to be a tracer with the government to make them put food on the table. Um, that's a good experience. You can, you know, get to talk to people and hear what's happening. Um, if you're a documentary person, and Anthony can speak to this with more specificity, you know, maybe document what's happening in your life. Who knows? Um, maybe, maybe that develops into a short, short film or gives you, use your own experience to do what, um, take the time to use your own experience to develop your creative side. Thanks guys. Um, uh, anonymous has asked, Ooh. Uh, can <laughs> there be a centralized location for virtual film events happening? Um, it's hard to keep track of all the events sometimes. Uh, I hear you, Anonymous, and yeah. uh, I think that I think that um, this is the start of us coming together in a more collective way. So, point taken, and we will discuss on our end to see if we can put together some sort of communal portal where information is easily accessible. Community calendar. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a few questions here that are all kind of around timeline. Um, and I know there's, so probably throwing it to you, Peter, there's not one, there's not the right answer, but the is there a general consensus as to if you think it's going to be safe to start shooting in October, November? I would love to say yes. I, I, you know, we're going to listen to science. Uh, we're going to get all of the information from all of the uh, partners. Um, you know, I've heard things from, uh, you know, some small commercials, you know, in, using insert shots, hand models, things like that to have shot, you know, like under 10 people crews. A, a lot of virtual directing ha has gone on, little small things, but the, the kinds of work that we do here, you know, the big stuff, the Chicago shows and things like that, I mean, we've got to get a lot of approval from a lot of different places. Uh, Christine mentioned it earlier, you've got to get the union approval. In the, in the Chicago show example, 
uh, the employer has to be uh, provide a safe workspace, and that employer is NBC Universal. And what are they going to do? And then you've got the insurance companies on top of it, who are we going to insure? So I've heard it, it runs the gamut. I would love if we could be safe and go back to work in October. I keep thinking about what kind of what, what are we writing these days? I mean, we don't know if we can have even a network television version of a love scene. You know, can, is that something that's going to be possible? I mean, that's how, how are you going to are you going to write those scenes? Uh, then with the Chicago shows, all three of those shows are first responders. Do they actually? I think they kind of have to uh, look at the world around them and relate to that. But then, how do we shoot that? I mean, one of the conversations we've been having is that uh, they may actually go build the firehouse now on, on land, and as opposed to take over because of, of safety concerns. So I, I wish I had a, a firm answer, but it just there just isn't an answer. It, to be determined and it changes a little bit uh, if not day to day yeah, and don't you think peter um that the commercial industry will be the first in yeah. terms of because it, of your point they're smaller um yeah. there are obviously commercials being made now obviously there's going to be a great need for it um messaging is going to shift and change yep and i think they'll be on the first the front line um, in terms of, because they can do it. And, and, and documentary, people. documentaries, documentaries, and, and, uh, yeah. Nonfiction stuff, reality, things like that, that that'll happen. Yeah. I'm actually on a three o'clock uh, today with AICP, the commercial producers, uh, where they're talking about, you know, what's going to happen. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, the, Chris, I have a sort of question about this. I mean, it, is my understanding one of the kinks that needs to get worked out before any production resumes is uh, insurance. Issues, yeah, risk right? management yeah. is a yeah. huge issue. Force majeure obviously has gone into, uh, you know, NBC to their credit um, held off on doing it and actually paid folks as did an extensive, a long, gave them a longer runway, um, as did a lot of the other, stu you know, uh, studios. But yeah, I think the lawyers, <laughs> once again, lawyers and insurance people are very involved and that's why this labor management safety committee uh, along with the dga um, committee that's being headed by steven soderbergh i have a great deal of confidence having listened to participated in in the national um, that there is no tension between the employers and labor the employers want a safe environment yeah. that you know so we're not into a contentious conversation here it's really what Again, the yeah. science, as Peter says, and also the risk management. And you're right, Anthony, insurance is a big issue. I'm not an expert on any of those on the um, insurance issues. However, comma, I have great confidence that they're the best of them are at the table, um, pivoting, if you will. Yeah, on that on that note, Chris, we have a question here on that. Does the IPA feel the industry will make a clarification? of force majeure clauses is it in any and all contracts a priority? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I don't know the answer and I'm happy to take that back to um, our, our leadership here um, to see if there, because that I knew what that term meant because I took Latin and I've done contracts, <laughs> but um, it became kind of part of the lexicon in the last month. So good question, don't know the answer, happy to uh, take a note and uh, get back to whoever asked it. Can you explain to us what that issue is? Force majeure? Yeah. And why uh, that's so important. Act of God. Right. Act of God is basically, if you have a contractual obligation, the employer, and I'm stumbling on this a little bit, so all of you folks who have done this, please, uh, if you can articulate it better. Basically, the contract is nullified because of an act of God. Um, and the employer has the opportunity to enforce that, which means no obligation is then owed um, to the employees and vendors and so forth. It's a little more complicated, I'm sure, but basically the interpretation of the is act of God nullifies the contract. Yeah. Did I get that right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I wanna come back to, uh, just a couple questions on like onset protocols, recognizing that it will, you, we likely do not have a firm answer. 
Um, and then I want to throw it to Colette. I have a question for you. But the the first is uh, is there is there any idea between Chris, you, and Peter um, if there is a general timeline as to when a general best practices guideline might be released? That's yeah, that'll holistic. be this week. Yeah, the, the, that's going to be a national one this week. Committee. Yeah. The white they, papers. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's anticipated um, to be released, I think, Friday or early next week, as I've been told by some of the major studios and, and the unions who are working toward that end, that the goal was to um, have, a, you know, um, and that'll be, again, a more industry labor relationship that it, it, all of it, I know somebody, I saw one of the questions, you know, it's a wild west. Everybody wants to feel relevant. Everybody wants to participate and under, you know, I think Florida came out with their, you know, best practices um, until the industry and management come together and it's anticipated that the first round of that will come up this weekend or early next week. Yeah. And then locally next um, Thursday, we're having a meeting uh, with production folk here to have sort of a, you know, pro what's the protocol going to be? And then it all is going to depend on what the government, city and state governments say. I um, mean, public health. Exactly. I mean, we, we, you know, we, we have to then, I, I am assuming there's going to be some version of testing needed, right? So, yeah. you know, then we have to have all of the testing uh, apparatus, you know, and, and, and get results relatively quickly. And, you know, what do you do for the guest stars? You know, okay, so the regulars who are there, you know, uh, on all eight days of shooting a, a weekly show, and I'm predicting that it's actually going to take longer to shoot now. I think we may have mm -hmm. shorter days and, and take, you know, you know, 10 days to shoot an episode or something like that. Uh, um, just because we're going to have to have these different, you know, people are going to be farther apart. It's just going to take longer. And I've heard shorter days uh, just in various things I've read, uh, shorter days uh, because of cleaning. Uh, needs. So we've got to get these rules and then we have to see how we execute them. Even if we all agree, this is exactly the right thing to do in the state, in the city and the unions and everyone says this is what to do. Then we have to actually put it all into uh, uh, play. And that's not going to happen overnight. I mean, it wouldn't happen from Thursday today to Monday. It's going to take some time to figure out all that stuff. Yeah. And there's also some supply chain issues yeah. related to this. With healthcare workers being at the front lines, obviously PPE um, testing and um, you know the health and safety of, of the vulnerable population and the, and the healthcare workers. So you've got a supply chain issue. You've got, I think, if I if anybody out there is an entrepreneur, talk to the young the person who asked the question, "What should I do?" Um, become an entrepreneur. Develop. Uh, you can run a business that just provides COVID active, I mean, resourcing and sourcing. Um, uh, there's going to be gloves, masks, all of these, what are they called? Smoker? You know, you have to smoke the, the set. Um, so to Peter's point, you have to have access to that and make sure that your production has all of that checklist. Uh, there is some conversation going around that perhaps production will actually um, not only have a production coordinator, but within that category, especially in larger, have a COVID coordinator um, to make sure that those checklists are done, um, that the, they access the, uh, the appropriate um, items that are going to be necessary now that heretofore weren't necessary. Thanks. I, I should say that people who are thinking of budgeting their projects, their own projects, um, we'll obviously have to start to take that, those costs into account and you're going to have to start uh, budgeting for extra COVID related safety measures. Yeah. I want to come back to that, but before I do, Colette, I want to throw it to you. Um, we have a couple of folks who are interested in the kinds of support your organization offers and I would love for you to talk a little bit more about the grant relief as well that you mentioned at the top of the call. Sure. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, we had to pivot in order to really figure out what the priorities of our community were. And even though building community and providing educational opportunities is important, we knew that right now we're in a crisis situation. A lot of our members are in crisis situations, already being part of 
the most marginalized communities and having family members um, directly affected by COVID. So we decided to put out a survey and the results were staggering. Over half lost all sources of income. Um, many of our members have lost their apartments. 25% have children and can't find child like child care support. It's just, it's a very dire situation. So this is what caused us to try to use our collective power to create a funding platform. So we made a GoFundMe and its goal amount is 15,000. We are at 3,000 right now. And with those funds, we are hoping to provide $500 micro grants out to filmmakers. So even though we say that it's micro, it really can be a life changer for our communities. And like, it, it can pay half of rent, it can pay, it can pay for a lot of things that um, are needed. So we haven't created the application yet to apply for the grants, but it's going to come out in the next week or two. So we can definitely like keep everyone posted about that. And um, if you would like to support, of course, that's always super <laughs> welcome and uh, where do we go to support very appreciated I'll, I'll write it in the chat right now <laughs> too um yeah so we know that there's like a lot of different funds happening right now and we are supportive of all of them and we also i actually would like to mention that um the community the child community has been super helpful for getting this campaign out um the cinema workers fund actually shared their own press list for their fund for us which is that's like the power of chicago right there and like uh, we feel super grateful for be doing this in our community. So, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Colette. Um, kind of along those lines, uh, I know we have uh, like 12, 13 minutes here. Um, we have a question. Uh, during the pandemic, we are seeing the best of people in communities. How can we, the Illinois production community, continue doing those good things to strengthen our community when we get back to normal times? Yes, That's for all of us, question. all of you. What, the, what, the, what <laughs> yeah. thoughts do you have? But in general, it's sharing, it's continuing to share resources, yeah. join forces. Chicago is not New York and LA, right? So we do have to, I think, work together more, more collaboration, more things like this. Supporting Colette, Colette, this, you know, the Chicago Workers Fund was started to, you know, you know, help the, that community and, you know, all the communities working together, right? And use your uh, individual resources or pick a, if you hear something that's good, buy the people lunch, maybe, um, you know, if they're doing something that's, you know, important to um, the, the pandemic effort and, and related to the film community. I know Angie and her husband have pivoted their business, his business to making the, the shields and, the, and uh, you know, are putting, you know, those shields in, ha in, in hands of people that need them and and that's terrific. I know a lot of people are helping with the food banks in their local community. Um, you know, if you have the resources to contribute, and if you don't, um, you know, if you have the wherewithal to volunteer, there are a lot of opportunities. And I think Anthony's point is best taken. Crisis brings people together. And I think we've seen that over and over again in our community. And we just have to and this is going to, I'm now meeting Colette. Colette's my new best friend. I'm going to reach out mm -hmm. and we're going to, you know, put her in our new, next newsletter to make sure that people are aware of what's going on. Uh, so just pick up the thread and start to weave the quilt um, because our community is, um, is, 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 is coming together. If you have any individual questions on where you can volunteer, I'm sure each and every one of us can give you a good, uh, good laundry list of things to do. Also, another main way uh, that I've seen filmmakers really come out is using their creativity to really provide a sense of community and like relief in terms of art with one another. And I've seen some amazing work come out of Mezcla members specifically around uh, making music videos off of Zoom and things like this that just really provide a lot of inspiration. So I know it's it can be hard to like stay creative in this time but if you have that interest to do so I would say to go for keep trying to create while while we're still at home too it adds a lot of light to our days yeah and if I could answer the question too to add on to that what I would say is um, just make sure you're really taking care of yourselves I used the analogy that the other day that it's, it's, or I, I am finding it much harder to be as productive 
It's like trying to cook an over medium egg in an earthquake. It's like <laughs> not doesn't go quite well. What you say. So the, the in that analogy, I would just encourage all of you to um, creativity is a mental game, right? And to really make sure that you're giving yourself grace and and taking care of yourself uh, in the process in order to continue continue to output at that creative level. So, yeah, um, I have a couple more questions here related, and I apologize, I know there are a lot and I will not be able to get to all of them, but uh, there are a few questions kind of around indie production. There are a couple of folks whose productions are have been halted uh, by the COVID-19 and they're concerned about going back to work, especially uh, with independent budget constraints with regards to any new safety items that might need to be purchased. Um, and then along those lines, a question around if there's any conversations with SAG-AFTRA or any of the other unions um, adjusting their budget level thresholds to reflect the cost increase that independent filmmakers will have to absorb in order to provide a safe working environment. Throwing a lot at the wall there, yeah. <laughs> so, but let me know what sticks and, and, and if you guys have any thoughts. Well, I, I can speak to the independent films that are in production or, or have had to halt production and go back to work. Uh, you're not going to be able to go back to work. Uh, uh, the city of Chicago is not permitting for a while. So if you're shooting in the city and you need a permit, you can't get a permit. Um, and then, you know, the party line is where you're following the guidance from the governor's office and the mayor's office. And right now we are still at, you know, groups of 10 or smaller, you know. Um, so that's that. I, I have not heard anything about uh, SAG um, uh, sure. adjusting the rates. I, I you know, I... Actually, just, SAG is in negotiations right now. Um, just like the Writers Guild was going to, you know, it was their time, uh -huh. you know, and... Uh, David White is the executive director of SAG-AFTRA. In fact, um, well, there was a conference call the other day and he had to, to leave, um, not a conference call, a presentation because they're in the middle. So I think to be determined, my guess is that's come up in their negotiations. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously their membership um, dues have diminished because it's based on activity and uh, residuals and so forth. So. Um, Good question. And, I, I, uh, I just saw Alyssa uh, Fraden pop up in the chat. Maybe she knows something. Oh, good. Yeah. If you're still here, Alyssa. Sorry to put you on the spot. Oh. Can you open that up, she Angie? says, I am, yeah. <laughs> Stand by. Work in one second. Angie's trying to find her so we can actually hear her voice. And another anonymous um, is relating the IATC contract tiers had been adjusted pre-COVID. So um, thank you, anonymous attendee. Alyssa with an I, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Kathy Byrne from uh, sag After tried to get on the call, but she was, she was off. So Alyssa, Alyssa, of course, is here. And there's her pretty face. Hi, Alyssa. Hi. You, you sh can we hear you? We can hear you. Oh, success. Yeah, just as a hi, everybody, <laughs> <laughs> to be put on the spot, but no problem. It's about the community. Um, so the question is very layered as far as SAG-AFTRA is concerned. Um, so we have the low budget independent films, as everybody knows, and you could contact Kathy Byrne, who administers to all uh, types of TV theatrical contracts throughout uh, the Chicago local and area. Um, the low budget digital waivers or the low budget digital films uh, are $125 and below. That means some are deferred, no pay until there's use or distributors rights, um, gross receipts, but otherwise it's $125 a day. So that's pretty low. Uh, the SPA agreement, it's a negotiable rate. So the SPA is the short production 
to um, Anthony's point that those short films are super accessible and you should absolutely contact Kathy because it's a super flexible contract as far as rates. Um, and Christine is absolutely right with the TV theatrical contract. We are uh, in a blackout period because we are negotiating with the AMPTP. And uh, those rates are national rates for national contracts. So those are gonna affect the productions that Peter Hawley is talking about, which is like all of NBC. And um, whatever kind of concessions are gonna be made, I doubt that any labor organization would make workers rates lower from NBC down. You know, it's like we could find different ways of um, budgeting, but I think that the, the national rates are the national rates and they go up from there, not down from there. So if you're working with low budget, meaning something that's an ultra low budget, um, a short film, a low budget or a modified low budget, those are all under the basic uh, film rate agreements, which are extremely um, accessible and doable on a day-to-day -day basis. So I hope oh. that helps um, us not Alyssa, undercutting uh, the actor. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just a, a point of clarification and a follow-up on that. Um, mm -hmm. Brian has said he's not qu questioning the rates, but the, the cutoff levels. So like 250, 600, et cetera. Do you see those changing for those, or shifting for the low budget films? Yes. So currently, um, once we get out of TV theatrical, they'll be able to address that because not that those are tied to one another, but everything we do flows off of the basic contract, that scale contract that you know NBC would use. So I can't say that that's something that would happen, but that would be something that would be discussed. And I think it's a great, um, I'm taking a note, and I think it's a great um, discussion topic to talk about budget thresholds and see what is doable to help filmmakers. And if you don't, um, if you aren't familiar with SAG Indie as an educational tool for filmmakers, you should check them out because um, generally what we do within SAG-AFTRA and our agreements, especially for low budget, SAG Indie is always teaching filmmakers about how to utilize the film with those budgets. And I just want to say to, to Chris, you are correct, our, our Christine, our um, our dues have been delayed to July. So we're giving people a break in dues so they can uh, obviously take care of the issues at hand during this crisis and not have to worry about paying dues and not be able to work when given the opportunity. So thank you all. I think you, this is a great topic and I'm so glad that I was here and I will be glad to go on mute and disappear again. <laughs> no, don't disappear. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Alyssa, for hopping on on the spot. We appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. And I'm a, a member. I'm an actor. I'm not a producer, director, or staff person. So I'm sure there could be things that could be corrected by staff. So please contact Kathy Byrne. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the uh i more? think we're go ahead anthony i was just saying want to take one more quick question yeah let's take one more and then we'll wrap up um uh, let's see here i will take um since we're since we just had Alyssa, i will take this question from Brittany with regards to actors uh, Brittany says as agents one of our biggest concerns is ensuring the health and safety of our actors on set um, can you guys speak to any initiatives on encouraging um, safety guidelines shared with cast, et cetera, or how actors can kind of factor into that? If you can speak to how actors factor into that discussion currently. Well, that's really going to uh, uh, sag after we'll be at that table. Yeah. Uh, number one. And I know Gab, uh, I've been watching and listening to Gabriella. What's her last name? Union? The um, Alyssa. <laughs> The president, I mean, there's a very active, my guess is, and this is just my speculation from my previous hat, uh, public policy, it's going to be a lot like the sexual harassment when all of that came, you know, to a crescendo, then suddenly there was, you know, production had to have additional training. And my guess is there will be a lot of, um, training involved. I think you're going to see, especially in the bigger shows, the medics are going to be much more proactively involved yeah. in, um, and there'll be a lot more training uh, that is going to take place specific to the COVID. So on top of the sexual harassment mm -hmm. training, 
you'll you know have health health training in a much more in-depth way um i would imagine not only medics but some people will probably are consulting with doctors and so forth to get the I think practice. it goes to the whole COVID coordinator yeah. position. It's, I mean, it's all going to flow out of that, I, I really think. I, and of course, the actors are at the front of the line here about their safety. Absolutely. I mean, and that's I mean, a, and I hate to say it, yeah. at the forefront of making yeah. sure that, that, there's, that the actors are protected first and foremost. So, um, yeah, I think the Steven Soderbergh committee, um, just some great irony for everybody. Steven Soderbergh is running the DGA committee and he, for those youngins out there who don't know, <laughs> he produced Contagion, filmed here in Chicago. <laughs> uh, not that old. Uh, if you haven't got some time in your hands, go watch that movie. Not only is it fun to watch the Chicago locations, but you might get a better indication of where this is all going. <laughs> <laughs> Although I Thank you. I don't want to give away the ending, but it may no. not be exactly <laughs> the same. Um, let me... Uh, <laughs> I agree with Kwame, don't watch Contagion. Yeah, right. So there's, there's, based on our conversation, uh, I think it's beholden to some of us here, there's three things that I want us to, to do. Um, I'm not sure who's gonna do each, but um, one is that we're going to create a virtual events calendar where all of the film organizations that are working on exhibition, webinars, masterclasses, can, where all of that can live. Two is a resource page for our filmmakers and media makers, where we we'll have links to grants, links to um, uh, safety guidelines, things like that. And third would be a how to help area, uh, where if you have money or time and you can devote that to the community, I think we, maybe we should have a page for that too. So I think we should all work on, on getting that up and running yeah. uh, relatively soon. Um, so yeah, we'll work on that. I would only add that our next, we're going to work to try and feature more and more of the organizations, um, and, and different aspects of our community. So our next town hall will be, uh, same time on Thursday, May 28th, um, from one to 2 PM. And we will have, uh, Cartemquin sisters in cinema, OTV, the Chicago Film Office, the Midwest Film Festival, and Full Spectrum Features. And hopefully, um, if, given the, the nature of everyone's enthusiasm, we will continue to have these conversations and expand the organizations and people involved. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe, stay safe. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you guys for putting this together. It was, it was terrific. It was terrific. Thank you.